you're not familiar with Simba Room, it's a role-playing game that got its start in Sweden back about 10 or so years ago and was picked up by the company Free League and re-released in English. Then in 2022, it was published again, but with the D&D 5e SRD or public rule set. This latest 5e version called Ruins of Simba Room was released as three books, The Player's Guide, GM's Guide, and Bestiary. I reviewed Free League's English language version of Simba Room in a previous video, and in that video, I said that my favorite aspect of this game was its setting, and that hasn't changed. In this video, I'm going to cover the Ruins of Simba Room, Player's Guide, and GM's Guide with a fair amount of detail. And then in a second video, I'm going to pour through the Bestiary book because I think it deserves its own video. Before I jump in, I want to give credit to Free League for the fact that they brought in the original authors of Simba Room to lead the design on this 5e version. It probably seems obvious that you would want to do something like that, but you never know these days. And also a thanks to Free League for the review PDFs and books. This video is sponsored by Dungenerator 2 by Roland Coons, inky illustrator and bizarro game designer. The first Dungenerator allowed you to make a nearly infinite variety of dungeons super quickly using a deck of cards or on a virtual tabletop. One of its greatest features was that you could combine multiple decks and mix and match from those decks to your heart's desire. Dungenerator 2 is the second in this series of decks that you can use to quickly build randomly generated dungeons at the table or on virtual tabletops. This new series brings more rooms, larger rooms, and even twistier dungeons. This new deck is jam-packed with more art featuring vegetation, ancient ruins, and expansion cards. You can build larger chambers that bend in any direction. To done generate is simple. Place an entrance, then shuffle the deck. Attach a room card to each open passage, one room at a time. If a room overlaps another, discard it and flip the previous room to the dead end side. Find the done generator on Kickstarter and back now. If you've ever purchased books from Free League or picked up one at a game store or convention, then you're already familiar with their specific qualities. They all tend to be the same size format and have thick covers with a matte finish. They're always stitch bound and with bookmark ribbons and nice vibrant colors in the interior. The three books that make up the core of Ruins of Simba Room run a total of about 650 pages, so it's a nice little sliver of bookshelf space. The GM screen that you can also get for the game is made of ultra heavy duty cardboard and has that same matte cover paper as the book's covers. As for the information on the inside of the screen, it does seem like it would be the most used in a game. Overall, these are gorgeous collector quality books, and these aren't even the Kickstarter exclusive collector editions, which came as black faux leather and silver foil. I do kind of regret not going for those, but these standard edition books still feel like a treasure. I pretty much summed up the Simba Room setting in my video on the original version of the game, but I'll reiterate it here just in case you forgot or you can't be bothered to click over and back again. If you're already read into the setting, you can just skip to the next section of this video. The setting's story is very tightly focused on a short timeline. Only 20 years ago, a medieval fantasy kingdom brought an end to a 20 year war with necromancers called the Dark Lords and their armies of undead. There isn't much detail about the Great War or the enemy they fought. The important thing is that the war devastated their realm and forced the queen of the kingdom, Queen Corinthia, to migrate north, past a brutally tall mountain range called the Titans, to the queen's ancestral lands. Here they found fertile lands and the intact ruins of a city that fell 200 years ago. As far as people, they found humans in countless disparate tribes collectively known as barbarians, and about half a dozen fantasy races like elves, dwarves, goblins, ogres, and trolls known as the Elder Folk. All of these fantasy races are largely reimagined in this setting, by the way, which is part of what makes Simba Room so good. I'll get into those reimaginings in this video. Anyway, this newly colonized land was named Ambria, and it was divided into seven duchies. And an old religion emerged, which now dominated this kingdom, the worship of the sun god Prios. This religion and the kingdom it dominates aims to do, among other things, cleanse and colonize the gargantuan forest north of Ambria called Davakar. This forest is the beating heart of the setting. I probably should have started with that. The very name of the game, Simba Room, or in this case, Ruins of Simba Room, refers to the name of an ancient civilization of highly advanced magic. No one quite knows how it fell, but it's widely believed that it battled the same dark forces that now plague the forest and threaten to spread across the entire region. That dark force is the corruption 
a black mystical aura that imbues plants, animals, people, and entire landscapes in the forest. It appears to originate from the vast network of caves underneath the forest. It's now been 20 years since the kingdom of humans transplanted themselves to their new area, and these Ambrians have to work together with the barbarians as well as the fantasy races, known as the Elder Folk, if they ever want to conquer the forest of Dabakar, let alone survive it. Because the forest is filled with the deadliest, most nightmarish creatures imaginable. I'm gonna skip over the many descriptions of each of the human factions of this setting, but I'll note that they present the tribal barbarians in a varied and interesting manner. What these tribes lack in formal warfare and logistical strategies that the Ambrians have, they make up for with their knowledge of the forest and connections to the animals of the domain. As the authors put it, they tried to walk a middle road between keeping things familiar enough for Dungeons and Dragons 5e players while also trying to retain the identity of Simbaroom's original play. I think they did a remarkable job of doing just that, where they didn't really touch the rules for combat or the action resolution mechanics, but they added a number of rules that reinforce the encroaching darkness of corruption and the brutality of the forest itself. There are specific rules for travel that differ across three types of terrain, the plains, light Davakar, and dark Davakar. I didn't mention this before, but the plains of Ambria are pretty much easy mode. Light Davakar, the general outer region of the forest, is dangerous, and then dark Davakar towards the interior of the forest is super deadly. One tweak to the rules that I think is critical here is that they change long rests from allowing you to recover all hit points to just recovering hit points equal to the maximum value of your hit dice plus constitution modifier. One of the biggest complaints about 5e is how generous long rests can be. So in this game, you can only recover all HP after an extended rest or 24 hours in a safe place. Social challenges are a simple mechanic to try and inject more than just combat into the game. Any given social challenge is broken into three parts. An introduction phase where one spokesperson or party rolls whatever applicable skill, which determines advantage on the evaluation. The second phase is a bit muddy. You just sort of talk it out and the GM tallies a score of their own design and awards advantage and disadvantage for the final roll. Then comes the final roll or evaluation where the outcome of the meeting comes down to a roll. It's kind of a weird mix between GM fiat and hard dice rolls. The biggest rules addition to the 5e core rules is corruption. This is honestly an aspect of the game that lends it the dark theme and sense of danger more than any other. Every PC in the game keeps track of two pools of corruption points, temporary and permanent. They pick up temporary corruption by casting spells, special contact or damage from certain enemies and environments, and using certain abilities for the most part. Permanent corruption comes from the same sources, but in more serious cases. Temporary corruption can be removed with rests, spells, and other means, but permanent corruption is permanent as far as I can tell. The idea is that corruption represents the dark force that is overtaking Davakar and the world. As an adventurer, you are exposing yourself to this force, and if you're daring or reckless enough, it will overtake you. Each character has a corruption threshold determined by their charisma and their proficiency bonus, so that threshold does increase gradually as their proficiency bonus inches up from leveling. If your character picks up more temporary and permanent corruption points than your threshold value, you have a chance at picking up a Mark of Corruption, which is a temporary magical mutation or curse that lasts for 24 hours past when you've been able to get your corruption below your threshold. If your permanent corruption goes beyond your threshold, your character is forfeit and the GM decides and the GM decides what kind of hideous, blight-stricken monstrosity you become. There's this other huge aspect of the game called your shadow. It doesn't really have any mechanics attached to it. It's more of an important thematic and narrative component of your character. Every creature with a soul in the setting has an invisible aura called a shadow, and normally it's bright and colorful. It can only be seen by certain creatures and with certain spells. Anyway, as you take on more permanent corruption, your shadow begins to look dirty and dark. In the case that you're on the verge of total corruption, your shadow is all but pitch black. The shadow is a really fun addition to social encounters when PCs or NPCs are trying to put themselves out as one thing, but their shadow reveals them as another. There's not much changed to the 5e rules when it comes to origins, except your hit points and hit dice are based on your origin and not your class. There are nine types of origins with a total of 25 backgrounds, 
and they're all derived from the original Simba Room Player's Handbook and Advanced Handbook. I did find it nice to have all of these character concepts in one place instead of split across two books. It's a pretty huge list of possibilities. I think it's nice to be able to play from all meaningful aspects of Simba Room's setting, even as an undead ghoul, as we'll see here in a minute. Abducted humans are the product of a phenomenon where elves steal human babies and replace them with human-looking changelings. And those humans are raised in the forest by the elves and trained up to be hunters and fighters. Changelings are those creatures swapped in for human babies. No one knows the difference until around adolescence when the changeling starts exhibiting elven features. This usually leads to banishment of the changeling from the Ambrian or Barbarian society, and they have to find a new place in the world. It's actually extremely depressing. But you get dark vision by default and the change self origin feat if you want. Actually, one of the backgrounds for changelings, mage's assistant, is one where you were actually treated well by a mystic tutor. By the way, I appreciate that the authors include these personality traits, ideals, bonds, and flaw tables because I think they could help with developing backstory, but I found that many of the table entries didn't really connect with the background that they were associated with. A lot of the entries are very generic, which I find vaguely disappointing. Dwarves in this setting are different from your vanilla fantasy construction. They're short, but wiry and not stocky. It suggested that they were created by magic in the old fallen empire of Simbaroom. They speak an impenetrable language of idioms and double meanings, and they have no souls. Since they have no soul, instead of taking on corruption points, they take on hit point and max hit point damage on a one-to-one -one basis. That also means they can't be resurrected. Also, humans hate them, so they get disadvantage on all social checks with Ambrians and Barbarians. Elves are the sort of poster child of Simbaroom, the epitome of dark fey awesomeness. Their written concept in the game is great, but the credit here must obviously also be extended to the artist Martin Grip. In Simbaroom, elves are creatures with a four-stage life cycle. These cycles each last for tens or hundreds of years and are named after the four seasons. Well, our seasons. The setting has its own names for its four seasons. But anyway, elves are either small, childlike spring elves for 50 years, brooding, reckless, adolescent, early summer elves for 150 years, or late summer elves for a couple of decades when they've cooled off a bit. But then they go into dormancy and metamorphosis that can last up to 50 years. By the way, this is a huge theme in Simbaroom, the cocooning or dormancy and metamorphosis thing. It gives the world a sort of grotesque naturalist vibe that meshes perfectly with the dark foresty theme. But that means if cocoons and pupa and pupating grosses you out, you'll need to find another game. Anyway, Elves emerge as autumn elves after a while, and these are your relatively level-headed, rational adult elves, and they stay this way for up to 400 years, growing up to seven feet tall. After a final dormancy, they emerge as winter elves, allegedly very reclusive and powerful creatures that the books don't really describe at all. In this game, you're given the traits and abilities for a summer elf, which includes dark vision, and the ability to swap skill proficiencies with each extended rest. Goblins in the setting are a lot like the traditional imagining of goblins in modern fantasy, except they're a bit less chaotic. For example, they are employed as the day laborers in the one major city of the setting, in Daros. They live until about the age of 20, at which point they wander alone into the forest and pupate in a cocoon to become the next kind of creature. And which kind of creature is that? An ogre or a troll, of course. Anyway, they have disadvantage in social checks with virtually all other races and usually work as treasure hunters or household help for rich folk. Humans come in largely two major categories in the setting. The Ambrians of the Seven Duchies who live in a feudalistic empire under Queen Corinthia and the many tribes of barbarians who are thought to be the distant descendants of the people of ancient Simbar but who now live in separate tribes and are loosely united under a witchocracy. Okay, ogres. In this setting, these are creatures that emerge from goblin cocoons in the forest, completely devoid of memories of their life as a goblin or any sense of identity. They go stumbling in the forest and latch on to the first person they see, which means that they end up as guards, servants, enforcers, and laborers a lot of the time. In a lot of respects, they are just like a traditional fantasy ogre, seven or eight feet tall, dark vision, distrusted or hated by civilization, tough in a fight. But then there are trolls, 
Sometimes a goblin cocoon produces a troll, which is really a very different creature from an ogre, even though they're both huge. Trolls have a fairly defined culture, and they try to collect newly pupated members and bring them into their underground realms for care and safety. They have their own language, and most importantly, they have a whole class of magic that uses singing. Oh, and they are really into making magic items called artifacts. Finally, my favorite in terms of its novelty, an undead revenant. You are dead, but your mind is still intact. It's not clear how you smell or if your flesh is actively rotting, but in the book it says you could remain animated for centuries, so I guess the flesh itself is in a state of suspended decay. Since you have no soul, you take HP damage instead of corruption points, and you don't need to sleep or eat food, but during long rests, you have to either drink blood or devour raw flesh, so that's a big character feature to consider. There are also some setting implications for, of the undead that I really like. Remember that the Ambrians relocated from their old kingdom just 20 years ago after a decades-long fight against necromancers and their undead army, so the people of Ambria still collectively remember and really dislike the walking dead. Also, the barbarians happen to not be well acquainted with the undead, so that freaks them out. From a game mechanic perspective, it's really the classes where you get most of the variation that informs how you'll play your character. In Ruins of Simbaroom, there are five categories. Captain, Hunter, Mystic, Scoundrel, and Warrior. Under these five headings are 32 classes to choose from. I actually prepared to go over the highlights of each class and subclass or approach because the mechanics here are really at the heart of the player's experience. For example, as a captain, you are proficient in any armor, but no tools, and you choose from one of eight fighting styles. At level one, you can buff your party's initiative rolls, and at level five, you can attack twice per turn and three times per turn at level 18. Then there are even more little features depending on if you choose the merchant master, officer, outlaw, or poet warrior approach. So yeah, going over even just the highlights of the 32 approaches, as they're called, would take too long. I guess if I had to sum it all up, I'd say that they're all quintessentially a D&D 5e way of presenting characters. That is, you start with some interesting powers that more often than not, apply to combat and confrontation, and by the time you're level 10 or 12, you're pretty hard to kill under normal circumstances. The way that spells work is something worth noting. You still have spell slots, and spells are still categorized by levels that don't match your character levels, but in this game, you're almost always paying a cost for casting by taking on corruption. Some spells can be favored, meaning you take on less corruption per cast, whereas other spells can never be favored. As a user of magic in this game, or a mystic, you have to choose at level 1 which approach to magic you will assume. There are artifact crafters who can reduce the amount of corruption that they take on by storing spells and objects. Self-taught, which take on more corruption than normal but have access to all spell lists. Sorcerers, who take on less corruption and can actually leverage a target's corruption against them. Staff mages, who use their rune staff along with arcane hand gestures to cast. Symbolists, who prepare spells and runes drawn onto their skin and mitigate the amount of corruption they risk by doing so. Thurgs, the holy priests of the sun god Prios, who by default heal and turn the undead. Troll singers, who sing their spells. Witches, who take on one of three paths, either the druidic green path, the red path of the healer, or the white path of the spiritual warrior. And finally, the wizard, which assumes a pretty straightforward approach to magic casting. In the setting, wizards are affiliated with the Ordo Magica, an organization that exists outside of the Ambrian duchies and the church. One other thing I'll mention in this sea of character options and features is that some of the approaches, such as the sapper, have some really lackluster in-game powers. In the case of the sapper, it's alchemical expert at level 17, which gives you advantage on any alchemist supplies check. Compare that to the level 17 feature of the Knight, Peerless Effort, which gives you advantage on all melee weapon attacks, or the final feature of the Wrathguard, a berserker archetype that can wield Champion of the Wild, which increases either strength or constitution by four for a maximum of 24. These disparities really force you to ask the question, how do you plan on playing this game? On one hand, you want to play this game to enjoy a good story inside of an awesome setting, so wringing your hands over which abilities are the best is missing the point. But on the other hand, 
5e rules are really steering you towards tactical considerations of combat encounters and ignoring the elaborate implications of ability combinations is almost like missing the point of the game. The boons and burdens that the game offers doesn't really clear up this conundrum very much either. You can choose from a ton of stat bonuses for your character in exchange for a narrative-based feature of your character's background or MO. The boons are largely just positive, but the burdens give you a negative character trait or problem in exchange for an even higher stat bonus. It's a min-maxer's paradise here, but at least you're asked to deepen the concept of your character at their inception. As far as weapons and equipment in this game, there isn't really much to say except that money in the setting is the thaler or dollar instead of gold, the shilling instead of silver, and the ore tag instead of copper. If you take a closer look at the cuisine people are eating in this world, you get very English vibes with maybe a dash of Scandinavian. Artifacts are the game's magic items, and here you have a variety of minor or lesser ones. Major artifacts are listed in the GM's guide. It's worth a quick glance at the list of spells in this game. The big takeaway here is that they are largely from the 5e SRD and not renamed for flavor. I can understand why they didn't reskin all the spells, because doing so would probably just annoy the player base the game is trying to cater to. But in a perfect world, they would have cut deeper into reimagining and renaming all of these spells to further fit the dark foresty world in the setting. So that was the Ruins of Simbaroon Player's Guide, a really solid, satisfying port of the original Simbaroon game, utilizing corruption and providing a consolidated array of interesting thematic character options. Even more striking to me though, was the GM's guide for this game, which does some surprising things that I don't only see in dedicated GM guides. The first section here recaps the basic 5e mechanics for resolving ability checks and saving throws. If you're watching this video, you probably already know all this stuff. One thing I found kind of cumbersome was the method that they suggest for difficulty balancing. I know there's a school of thought out there that encounters don't need to be balanced and by not having balanced fights, players are more likely to think outside the box, etc. But D&D 5e rules are predicated on balanced encounters by default. The authors address how to prep a combat encounter to be balanced here in a way that leads to relatively deadly and challenging fights. The problem is, I find that it's kind of a pain in the neck to do all this CR accounting. I'm not a fan of completely random encounters, but this feels like the opposite end of the spectrum with meticulously planned combats based on the express intent of being fair. The next chapter goes into depth into three locations in the setting and touches on some really crazy stuff at the end. The first location is Thistle Hold, the walled outpost of about 10,000 people at the edge of the forest of Davakar. Just as with the original Simbaroon books, this location is described in every possible way. It serves in the setting as an anchor point for adventurers who are entering or emerging from the forest, but also as a location for town intrigue and adventures. The creators of this game didn't make a bunch of towns bordering the edge of the forest, I think, for two reasons. The first is because of the setting's story itself. Ambrians only just arrived in the region 20 years prior, so the plains that they occupy are essentially all frontier land that's only been newly settled. There hasn't been enough time for more than one fledgling frontier city to develop yet. And the second reason is actually stated by the authors themselves. They limited the breadth of the game's setting to focus on depth and quality rather than quantity. So even though Thistle Hold is the only major frontier town in the setting, the details here run pretty deep. That being said, you also have Indaros, the Ambrian capital city of 100,000 people or more, built on the ruins of a centuries-old city-state. Whereas Thistle Hold is a nest of frontier violence and intrigue, Indaros is the setting's answer to truly urban adventures and social encounters. The Queen Corinthia resides in an opulent palace here, and you have wide city streets and dozens of zones and factions to work with. The third location is Carvasti, a high plateau inside the forest that is home to the annual conference of barbarian chiefs and their witch advisors. It's a sacred place for them, but also the new home of the Church of Prios leaders who are trying to establish a stronger foothold in the forest. Admittedly, this is a far less complex location than the two towns. Finally, the authors describe three other locations, but all in only the briefest of detail. The underworld is a physical space in the setting, a vast network of caves, tunnels, and crevasses that exists under the forest. It's dominated by dangerous predators and 
pocketed with corruption and blighted beasts. There are no settlements down here and no leadership. Unfortunately, there are really no illustrations of the underworld either, but the good news is that the authors plan to publish an underworld supplement sometime in the future. That supplement will also include further details of the yonder world, a metaphysical dimension or parallel world or array of parallel worlds, it's not clear, but which is tied to certain spells in the game. The idea is that the yonder world might have been where humans originally came from, but that world became so overrun with corruption that humans fled to the current world. If characters were to visit the yonder world, they would see vast deserts, towering mountains, sudden violent storms, and the buried ruins of huge civilizations. They would also be picking up corruption just by being there. The events table here, and I should have noted this with the underworld events table as well, but the tables only give you a 1 in 10 chance of encountering a monster. They're mostly about creating an interesting scene or clue about something. Finally, there's the spirit world. This is not a place characters are really allowed to visit. It's more of a foggy purgatory dimension where souls are kept for a short time before dissolving into an infinite beyond. If as a GM you do allow PCs to visit, it would probably be to allow them to interact with a recently deceased for a short time, but at a high cost. The chapter on expeditions in Davakar discusses the type of missions you could have in the forest. Treasure hunts, first and foremost, but also exploration, maybe for the queen's cartographers or something, missionary work for the Church of Prios, a manhunt, or even a monster trophy hunt. But really, one of the most important things about this chapter, and really this whole book, is the discussion on travel. The game employs a daily orientation role when traveling through wilderness, and PCs are exposed to a variety of possible misfortunes depending on their role. They can improve their orientation role by having a guide or two and having a higher survival skill rating, and actually planning their expedition. Bonuses to orientation checks are awarded for every day of planning research that the PCs conduct. Encounters and events are also thoroughly described for GMs, as are the variety of curiosities and treasures the characters might find. And a ruins generator is pretty handy here. I would love to see more examples of architecture depicted by the artist in future supplements though. You get a snippet of architecture here and there and hints of it, but it would just be cool to see Martin Grip go nuts on some Simbar towers and ziggurats or whatever. I think where I started to get seriously impressed with this GM's guide was right here where the authors get their hands dirty describing the specific phases of specific forest missions. The first example here is establishing an outpost. There's just a blow by blow of what the characters would need to do from session to session in order to create and operate such an outpost. Conquest is another one where you wouldn't think there were phases to it, but here you are. Phase one, gathering intelligence. Phase two, mustering troops. Phase three, the march. Phase four, the battle. Phase five, establishing dominance. Conquest is actually pretty brutal and unpleasant when you start looking at the details. Even more unpleasant would be a holy mission where PCs go into the forest to systematically convert free peoples to the Church of Prios. But moral quandaries aside, the thoroughness with which the phases of a holy mission is written is just incredible. As your holy order marches into the forest, they could be met with all kinds of strange events. And that's just the beginning. Actually converting people is a whole little mini game. And even if you manage to get past that, you gotta get to building that temple. It's great. Monster hunts are probably the first place most GMs will go, and these are also thoroughly described just like the others. The authors are incredibly open about the thought process that went into creating the world of Simbaroom, and they try to share as many insights as they can in this next chapter. My takeaway on this section is that they really don't treat their game like it's all that special. It's a thing they made and that's it. You can change it if you want. You can make your own completely different world and here's how. I was just surprised to see that sort of humble, honest attitude. And that shared wisdom extends to creating adventures, which they divide into two different paradigms, the traditional linear adventure and the adventure landscape, which you see again and again in other free league games. The adventure landscape is a location or region that contains a number of randomly accessible points or events that the players can go to. There's an overall plot overlaying the whole thing, but the path that the players take is up to them. The authors describe how to structure an adventure in both ways, but with the adventure landscape, they actually include a full example at the end of the book called 
Blight Knight, aspects of which are frequently referenced in this chapter. Magical treasures are discussed as a means of awarding players, and you get a section describing a couple dozen major magical items, some in great depth. Jirakasha's Steel Circle, for example, comes with a whole adventure setup, and there are a lot of items that go deep like this, which suggests that each of these more in-depth artifacts could be the basis for one or several sessions of play. In the new and optional rules chapter, there are half a dozen well-described game mechanics that I think succeed in elevating this game well beyond the bog standard of 5e rules. I'm only going to briefly describe each because it would take too long to really unpack them all. The first notable rule is ceremonies. These are extremely powerful rituals that can alter an entire area or region, and they are only performed by NPCs. The idea is that PCs are likely trying to prevent NPCs from completing one of these ceremonies or are suffering from the effects of a ceremony in an encounter. The ceremonies are described in great detail, and when reading them, you can really get a sense of how they can be used as dramatic tools. Things like earthquake and mass resurrection just scream to be put into a, the climax of a game session. Chases are a well-done mechanic where you basically have three positions, close, far, and seeking. As the groups roll athletics or acrobatics against each other, they either upgrade or downgrade the position. If it dips down below close, the pursuing group wins. If it dips up above seeking, the fleeing group escapes. There are also obstacles depending on the environment, and they come into play whenever anyone rolls a one. Domains are a way for players to own and operate land. Well, since there's a feudal system in Ambria, maybe they don't technically own the land, but it just depends on how and where they got it. Anyway, there are some fun rules for that, and they primarily involve a management role four times a year to determine operating costs and possible events that need to be handled. The pages spent here on developing social challenges was appreciated, even though the underlying new mechanic they propose is not particularly involved or structured. The best aspect of this section is that the authors really deconstruct the softer narrative side of talking with NPCs by explaining what composes character reputations, as well as their tendencies and motivations. There's even a brief description of most types of people you might meet in the setting. The larger battle rules are a lot more mechanical in nature. A so-called pitched battle is broken down into five phases, and there are several methods of calculating the possible outcome of the overall battle. There are also rules for players to operate as battlefield commanders, where they have to make command checks and risk suffering something from the army misfortunes table. All right, here are my thoughts on the Ruins of Simbarum Player's Guide and GM's Guide. 5e turn economy. When you adopt a game to the D&D 5e rules, nine times out of 10, you're going to inherit the phenomenon of super powerful class features that stack as players level up. And as they level up, the monsters have to get stronger in order to compete. And as that happens, all the characters end up with more and more actions per turn. If you only play 5e or 5e based games at lower levels, you really don't have this problem. But once you're up to around levels 9, 10, or 11 and beyond, combat turns can be a bit of a slog as everyone sorts through their myriad actions and special benefits with each turn. This is not a problem unique to D&D 5e, but it's a problem that Ruins of Simbaroom has adopted. Consolidated player options. I really love having all of Simbaroom's player options contained in one book, as opposed to spread across two, as they were in the original. More character option detail. Just by virtue of the fact that 5e is a more complicated game than the original Simba Rim rules, these books are written with more detail when it comes to character options and details. New rules. There are about a dozen new rules that make this game greater than the sum of its parts. It's not just Simba Rim plus 5e rules. It's a 5e variant in the amazing and unique Simba Rim setting that includes a brutal ever-present corruption mechanic as well as dangerous travel rules a social challenge minigame, huge NPC ceremonies, chases, domain level play, and battlefield scale mechanics. It really feels like the authors wanted to bring the 5e rules closer to Simba Room's original mission of creating a dark and gloomy forest world that is deadly for players, rather than just translating the rules to the 5e SRD and calling it a day. Long story short, I think they created a remarkable game out of all of this, but one that still requires that you tolerate a highly ordered tactical approach to combat and characters whose abilities balloon over time 
and makes the GM reach for ever more powerful blight stricken monstrosities to throw at them. So that's all for now. Like I mentioned at the top, I'm going to cover the Ruins of Simbarum Bestiary in my next video, mostly because that book is special enough to warrant its own treatment. Thanks for watching. Links are below. See ya.